The autumn of 1975, Graham Hill was in a new phase of his life. He had just retired from Formula One as a two-time world champion, as well as the only driver in history to win the F1 championship, Indianapolis 500, and 24 hours of Le Mans. From cinematic near-death experiences to triumphant comebacks, Graham Hill was a living legend. But on a cold and foggy November evening, Graham's heroic life came to a sudden and tragic end when the private plane he was piloting crashed. Just months after making his exit from one of the most dangerous jobs in the world, the seemingly invincible Graham Hill was taken in a crash that no one saw coming. His untimely death left his family both broken and broke, with his only son Damon left to pick up the pieces and carry on the Hill legacy. How can the lessons of those that came before us help us overcome our own challenges? Would Damon achieve greatness like his father? Or would the pressure of being Graham Hill's only son prove to be too big a burden? Today on Past Gas, we're talking about the power of family and the importance of character through the incredible careers of Graham and Damon Hill. Past Gas Podcast, it's about cars, it's not about forts. Miss Bird, you cannot change. You know what that reminds me of? What? Grand Theft Auto 4, yeah. driving by Mount, Mount Chiliad. Grand Theft Auto 4. Grand Theft Auto. Welcome back to Past Gas, everybody. The voices you hear before you. I'm Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my co-host, James Mumphrey. Yo, what's up? I'm eating meatballs right now. <laughs> he is literally eating meatballs. I'm eating some meatballs. Uh, and we have that other voice, maybe familiar, maybe not. Andy Paws in the studio. Hey, Andy everyone. Paws, one of the most talented people in the unit. If you're familiar with any of our merchandise, any of our apparel, Andy is the man behind it. It's one of my favorite parts of the business. And honestly, working on clothes with Andy is uh, a true pleasure. So head wow, on over thank to you so much. donutmedia.com. Get yourself some cool shirts, some cool hats. New stuff every week. Super fun. Awesome. This week we're talking about the Hill family, Graham and Damon Hill. Uh, super interesting story we're about to get into here. James, how about you start us off this week? Sure, yeah. Norman Graham Hill was born on February 15th, 1929, in the Hampstead area of London. A decade later, London became an absolute war zone, so learning resilience was required from Graham at a young age. As a kid, he was interested in all things mechanical. So at 16, Graham became So at 16, Graham became an apprentice for the Smith Industry Company. He also bought a motorcycle and on one foggy night, crashed it into the back of a parked car. Pretty familiar experience, I think, for a lot of people who just buy a motorcycle on a whim. I mean, we're two paragraphs into this, and fog has played a big role. <laughs> <laughs> Graham broke his thigh, which sounds like it's hurt. It hurts. There's a lot of meat around that bone. Uh, an injury that permanently shortened his left leg, causing him to swim in circles for the rest of his life. <laughs> Despite this injury, Graham served for the Royal Navy as part of his compulsory service. He hated being in the Navy and decided to grow his now trademark mustache in protest of the typical clean-cut look commonly adopted by those in the service. After Graham left the Navy in 1950, he was looking for his next adventure. So, in 1952, at the age of 23, he joined the London Rowing Club and began rowing at a competitive level. The most British thing you can do. <laughs> the London Rowing Club changed Graham's life in more ways than one. While there, he met Betty, a fellow competitive rower who would become his wife and strongest supporter. You know what, guys? But behind every great Graham is a great woman. You know? Mm -hmm. no, Nolan knows what I'm talking about. I do, yeah. Nolan's in love. Mm -hmm. You would say that? I would definitely say that. How long have you been in love for? Two years. Mm. Two years. I'm in love. I want to be in love so bad. I want to get a girlfriend by the end of, when's this airing? November 14th. I need to have a girlfriend by November 20th. By November 20th, 
We got to get Andy a girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, we are now recording this on Hollow. It's November 1st. Yeah. yeah. What's the day after Halloween? November 1st. Yeah. November 1st. So we have, what, 20 days to get you a girlfriend? Yeah. This sounds like a rom-com. Sandra yeah. Bullock, hit us up. <laughs> but if there's anyone like Sandra Bullock, uh, a Zoe De Chanel. Maybe Sophia Vergara, Sophia even Vergara. if you're 51. Yeah. Maybe, um, uh, who's the one from her? I don't know. Scarlett Johansson. Oh yeah. You and Scarlett Johansson would be so cute We'd together. be a great couple. All those women listen to this podcast. So Do ladies, really? Andy is single. Yeah. He's hot. He has a job. I do have a job. He's a very talented artistic type. He has two cars. I mean, he's a catch. November 20th, that's the cutoff date, or he won't get his inheritance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get Andy a wife. Then we can all double. We could triple. We yeah, could that'd be date. sick. It'd be great. Let's do it. Graham would later say that his experience rowing helped his racing career. I really enjoyed my rowing. It really taught me a lot about myself. I also think it's a great character-building sport. The self-discipline required for rowing and the never-say-die attitude obviously helped me through the difficult years that lay ahead. Uh, obviously, in rowing, there's not a lot of never-say-die. It's a pretty boring sport that's not very <laughs> dangerous. Although, my cousin was on the University of Louisville rowing team, and they got run over by a barge. Are you serious? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Aren't barges famously slow watercraft? Yeah, they were on uh, the Ohio River practicing at like four in the morning or something, mm. and they got sucked under a barge. Did Jesus they just die? No, she survived. How many people died? None. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, so it wasn't that big of a deal then. L Kentucky Strong, baby. Louisville. I didn't even know Kentucky had Home like... of Jack Harlow, okay? I know. <laughs> they they don't... We, they make them different in Louisville. They do. He's tall, too. No Jack one's ever Har seen a white boy with curly hair before. Yeah. yeah. Jack Harlow, <laughs> Muhammad Ali, James Pumphrey. They make them different. Louisville, Kentucky. Shouts. Later on, Graham would wear the club's insignia and colors on his racing helmet. Cool, dude. <laughs> it was on a whim in 1953 that 24 year old Graham decided to put his love of mechanics to the test. He wanted to drive a race car. He followed an advertisement, which is how you say advertisement in British, where you could pay one pound to try a Cooper F3 car. Now, Nolan, a Cooper F3, that's an F3 a three racing car. Yeah. car. It's a Formula 3 car. That's like a real deal. That is a real deal open-wheeled race car. Mm -hmm. Like if you've ever seen the movie Rush. Yes. In the beginning when James Hunt and Nikki Lauda pull up and Hunt's like partying. They're like, who are all these blokes? Those are Formula 3 cars. Yeah. This is a real race car. Mm -hmm. For a dollar, you could drive <laughs> one of these. <laughs> yeah. After just four laps around Brands Hatch and Kent, he was immediately bitten by the racing bug. How? Ow! Even though Graham knew racing was his future, there were a couple of problems with his new dream. First, he didn't have a driver's license, and a racing career is extremely expensive. But if I know anything about Graham, it's that he's determined. Graham bought a Rattletrap 1934 Morris and taught himself how to drive. He quit his job making instruments at Smith's. And Ever the Charmer talked his way into a job as a mechanic at a racing school and worked alongside Formula 3 champion Don Parker. It wasn't long before he became an instructor himself, but nonetheless, the beginning of Graham's career was, let's just say, a little bit tricky. His wife, Betty, worked as a secretary. We call them phone gals now. Uh, and was actually the primary breadwinner for the family at the time. Graham competed in a couple of races thanks to his connection to Parker and the school. But it wasn't until a chance meeting in 1954 that he made major strides in his career. While at the August Bank holiday meeting, Graham hitched a ride back to London with none other than Colin Chapman, who was then in the early stages of developing his Lotus cars. 
Graham used his signature charm and wit to secure a part-time job with Chapman at one pound per day, which is a dollar a day. He could drive an F3 car once a day. I don't... What what was going on? (laughs) (laughs) He quickly proved his mettle and became a (laughs) full-time Lotus employee, rewarded with the occasional race in a Lotus 11 sports car. In 1958, Chapman decided that Team Lotus was ready to make the jump to Formula 1 with Graham Hill as one of its drivers. Unfortunately, the Lotus 16 was slow and unreliable, and when it didn't improve despite upgrades for the 1959 season, the ambitious Graham Hill ditched his first team for BRM, British Racing Motors, for the 1960 season. He said, dude, Mr. Chapman, thank you for all you've done for me, but this car sucks shit. I'm out of here. (laughs) And he said, uh, make it, make it, make power and add lightness. I don't want to pass judgment on these people. I don't know them, obviously, but like, <laughs> it's their first season. Give them some time. At the time, BRM had only been around for a decade and was Britain's attempt to put the country back on the map. But the only thing was, is that they were absolutely terrible. Snap, crackle, flop read one notable headline from the time. Despite the breakfast cereal headlines, Graham quickly became BRM's golden boy and really turned things around for the team. What Graham lacked in natural driving talent, he made up for in his mechanical and engineering skills as well as his infectious friendliness. The guy was so friendly, it started itching. Kind of like Mickey Lauda without the friendly part. Mm -hmm. Graham persuaded his team to work extra hard on his car, and as a result, what does that mean? He had a good attitude, and he was motivated for the car to work properly. And he had an understanding of the car. Like, you know that scene in Days of Thunder where Tom Cruise and um, Ed Harris? I think Ed Harris is in it, right? We're sitting at the bar, and, like, Tom Cruise admits to him, he's like, I don't know what any of the words mean. (laughs) He's like, they put me in a car, they told me to drive, I could drive. So, like, he could drive, but he couldn't tell the crew how to set up Mm -hmm. the car. Mm-hmm. I think, like, back in the day, like, this was still, like, a pretty hobbyist sport. Oh, for sure. Yeah. This is, like, a bunch of rich guys. They didn't start in karting when they were eight. They decided to start doing it when they were, like, 20, mm-hmm. if if not older. And so, like, for someone to be really interested in the mechanics of the car and, like, make tweaks to, like, the alignment or, you know, suspension dynamics or, you know, tighten up the steering here and there. I think that was like a pretty rare thing. And, you know, a welcome change from like the gentleman drivers. Right. That came before. Yeah. Yeah. The result of that camaraderie between Graham and his teammates was the legendary 1962 P57 V8 engine that was developed with Graham at the helm with P57 ready to go after years of fine tuning. Graham and the BRM team began the 1962 season with one goal in mind. Be the first to win the F1 World Championship with a British designed car driven by a British driver. Oh, Graham! Oi, oi, oi! <laughs> Graham had nine races ahead of him and some stiff competition. Team Lotus's soft spoken Scotsman, Jim Clark, was the one to beat. Have we talked about Jim Clark? Uh, an he's, he's popped up in a few he's popped up episodes. in a lot. I don't yeah. know if we've dedicated an entire. We should do that for sure. Yeah, yeah. But even <clears throat> obviously, because like a lot of these stories are from the same era, whether it's uh, Formula One or all the Shelby, uh, like IndyCar, sports IndyCar, car, racing, Le Mans Le stuff. Yeah, it's basically like in each of those sports, there's eight guys. I picture them all at the same bar. Yeah, talking trash to each other. There's a very like the diagram, the Venn diagram is not very spread out. It's a very, yeah. it's not a and full circle. My God, it's pretty close. If I could live and hang out with any group of guys, it would be them. Let's say it at the same time on three. Wait, what are we saying? Who we are? The group of guys we'd want to hang out with. Oh, yeah. yeah the bits passed. Right, one, two, two three. three. Chill, kill me. Louder. Okay. Because you know that one part in, in Rush where he goes, I need magnesium parts, and then screams at everyone, mm-hmm. yeah. and then they did it, dude. That's Which it. I didn't... Do you want to be screamed at? Yeah. <laughs> it's his king. Yeah, I'm into that. How I feel like <laughs> magnesium is heavy. No, it's pretty mm-hmm. light. Magnesium's super light. Yeah. Okay, got gotcha. you. It catches on fire, though. It That's can, what it, it is. That I out. knew something was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I knew there was something wrong mm-hmm. with it. That's why we don't use it anymore. That's true. Yeah. I would, I would want to be like... Ken Miles, like, funny friend. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not 
the best driver, not the best mechanic, but like, so, oh no, Pumphrey's coming with me. Pumphrey, I, I gotta have Pumphrey on race day. I can't, I can't drive without Pumphrey. He's so funny. I want to be like, uh, yeah, like Ken Miles and Carol Shelby's like funniest friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you know your internet service provider knows literally everything you do online? It's true. Might as well be handing your laptop to a stranger and opening up your browser history. That's why having a VPN is an absolute must have every time you go online. I want to tell you about one of the best VPNs out there and easily one of the most affordable ones I've seen, PIA. PIA stands for Private Internet Access and they take privacy very seriously. Not only does PIA hide your IP address, it encrypts your entire connection. This protects your internet activity from everyone, your internet service provider, network admins, or any hackers out there just itching to steal your most sensitive information. I like PIA. It's one of the safest out there you can find. If you're gonna do a VPN, you should use PIA. So right now go to PIAVPN.com slash gas to get a whopping 82% off your VPN service. Plus four free months with a two year plan. It comes out to around two bucks a month. You can't beat that. And there's a 30 day money back guarantee. That's PIAVPN.com slash gas for 82% off private internet access. PIAVPN.com slash gas. The 1962 season finale in South Africa would come down to those two, Graham in the P57 and Clark in the revolutionary Lotus 25. With three victories each under their belt, South Africa was a tiebreaker. Clark and Graham were neck and neck the whole race until the 67th lap when a puff of white smoke poured from Clark's so-called unbeatable car. Jim Clark was forced to retire, and just like that, at 33 years old, Graham Hill won his first F1 World Drivers' Championship. Yeah, I mean, Clark was almost done with the race. He could have waited, but he had to hit the vape. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a that was illegal in F1 at the time. The press loved Graham Hill, especially his signature cheeky mustache and bold sideburns. I'd say that sideburns are more cheeky than mustaches. Because they're on your cheeks. Indeed. He was the natural, quick-witted charmer that he had always been. But thanks to his notoriety, Graham had a larger audience and much better parties to attend. In fact, he became famous in the media for his fondness for dancing on tabletops, over-the-top strip teases, and even streaking around swimming pools. You ever skinny dip, Andy? I I haven't. I never really? have. Never skinny dip. Never. <laughs> it feels great. Does it? It mm. does. Actually. What are you guys doing this weekend? Skinny dipping with you. <laughs> well, what if what we what just did now. that, what guys? If you're the, listening and if you're free this weekend, um, let us know. What's the <laughs> What's the pool Airbnb? Swimply. Yeah, we're gonna get a swimply. Yeah, the biggest swimply we can. Oh find. my god! You know what we can get? We could rent out the old hype house, the original one that has the Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah, that's a swimply. Dude, we're gonna run. The, okay, guys, on was it November twentieth, the day I get my girlfriend. Okay, on November twentieth to celebrate Andy's new girlfriend. Yep, we're gonna rent the old hype house, Swimply, skinny dipping, not required, but allowed. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be a time and a half. Don't miss out. Just show up. You can Google <laughs> it. Graham also developed a new love for flying when he bought a plane and piloted it with a carefree, nonchalant fitting of its name, the Hilarious Airways. <laughs> That's so sick. In the years after his first championship win, Graham furthered his star power by dominating the glamorous Monaco Grand Prix. He won three times in a row and five times overall in his career and was coined the nickname Mr. Monaco. Mm. He fit in seamlessly in every inch of the place, from having tea with Princess Grace Kelly to gambling with the regular folk. Graham Hill was loved by all. Graham Hill was a straight P-I-M-P P-I-M-P. I'm into this vibe. I feel like this doesn't exist anymore. Look up a picture of him. Oh my God, dude, yeah. This is my vibe. What's your alias? Sebastian Marcona. Yeah, that's Sebastian Marcona's 
friend in England. Wait, like, we. Oh, okay. I gotta hit. I have to hit up Graham. I'm gonna be in London. He's gonna be pissed if I don't see him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta check in. I gotta go to one of the many Soho houses in London. I think that if um his story ever becomes a movie, if it's not already, oh, yeah, who would you cast him? Me. You? Yeah, I'm Sebastian. <laughs> as Sebastian Marcona plays Graham Hill, mm. and then you would play who's another good guy? Who's another guy with like a similar? Oh, vibe I'd be to the this. Scottish guy. I'd be Clark. Yeah. Yeah. Glam. Glam, you're partying too much. I want to be a fight, a fighting guy too. Like, na- like bring some like NASCAR into it, you know? Hmm. Come 1966, Graham was ready for his next challenge to tackle the Indy 500. At the time, Indy was the largest single day sporting event in the world. Super Bowl, never heard of it. And one of the most dangerous races, too. Before 1966, 47 men had lost their lives as part of Indy, including the race, qualifying, and practice. So, despite Graham's position as an F1 champion, the race was sure to be a challenge. On May 30th, 1966, Graham was ready to go at his first Indy driving a Lola T90 Ford. However, there was a massive crash within seconds of the start. 16 cars piled up with drivers like A.J. Foyt, scaling the fences to escape the wreckage. 11 of the 33 starters were eliminated. But aside from a hand injury, no one was seriously injured. So, 90 minutes after the wreck, they all lined up to do it again. They don't make them like they used to. Yeah. Right? Nowadays, they would have run home, put on their gaming headsets, joined the metaverse, and played some freaking... NFT poker <laughs> while they're eating uh, flaming Hot Cheetos mac and cheese. That's a man. And blue Takis. Blue Takis are good. I, won't, I will not eat blue Takis. Huh. Maybe you aren't Graham Hill. Graham Hill famously loved blue Takis. <laughs> really? Yeah. His car had a big blue Takis uh, logo on the side of it. What if what if that was his sponsor, just it blue Takis? Blue Takis. This is blue Takis, specifically mm-hmm. blue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I saw my friend smoke weed out of a Taki one time. <laughs> <laughs> After three hours, there were only seven cars left on track as Graham Hill passed the finish line in first place. Graham had won his first Indy 500, becoming the first rookie to win since 1927, the year that Nolan was born. He received a prize of $200,000 and, of course, a quart of milk. <clears throat> Away from the track in the public eye, Graham was a family man, a father of three kids, all under the age of 10, Brigitte, Damon, and Samantha. Because his job took him away from home so much, though, when Graham was home, he was extremely involved. However, Betty and the kids were very aware of how dangerous Graham's job was. There was a heavy cloud over their house whenever a colleague of Graham's would die on the track, and as a result, the hills were constantly living in the shadow of death. But nothing could hold Graham back. By 1967, he had an F1 World Championship, three consecutive wins at Monaco, and an Indy win under his belt. But the Formula One BRM team was falling apart. It was time for Graham to jump ship. He ended up back at Team Lotus, which was the home of Jim Clark, winner of the Drivers' Championship in both 63 and 65. Though they were rivals, the two became a powerhouse for Lotus as an unlikely odd couple that the press loved to talk about. Graham was outspoken and charming, while Jim Clark was more modest and shy. As they traveled the world as teammates, the two bonded and became close friends. In 1968, Graham and Clark were set to go head-to-head in their Gold Leaf Lotus 49s at a non-championship race at the Hockenheim ring. Sorry. In 1968, Graham and Clark were set to go head-to-head in their Gold Leaf Lotus 49s at a non-championship race in Hockenheim ring in Germany. Though the conditions were damp, it wasn't too wet to drive. To this day, no one knows what went wrong, but on the fifth lap of the race, while he was going 160 miles an hour, Clark's car flew off the track and into an adjacent wooded area. Jim Clark died instantly at only 32 years old. Clark's death was devastating to everyone in motorsport. Fellow powerhouse driver Jackie Stewart described his death as, quote, the atomic bomb going off. For Graham's part, not only had he lost a teammate and a close friend, but he was forced to step up as the leader of his grieving team. 
and step up he did. Graham took their collective devastation and channeled it into winning. Just a month after Clark's death, Graham won the Spanish Grand Prix, and then again at Monaco. These wins were a huge morale boost for Team Lotus and Britain in general. Then, Graham drove his Lotus to a second World Drivers' Championship in Mexico City. After a shattering season of loss, Graham dedicated his title to Jim Clark. On the heels of a cathartic championship win, Graham entered the 1969 NICE season with Team Lotus. But the high of his second driver's championship would soon come crashing down. On October 5th, Graham was in his 88th lap of the U.S. Grand Prix at Watkins Glen when his Lotus spun off the track on a patch of oil. The car stalled as Graham got out to give it a push start, but his off-track excursion had punctured a rear tire. Moments later, that tire exploded. The car was sent tumbling into an embankment, and the impact broke both of Graham's legs. Since Graham was 40 years old, everyone assumed that his career was over. It was unclear if he would ever walk again, much less get into the cockpit of a race car. But Graham Hill was a fighter, as well as a race car driver. He took the rest of the season to get back into fighting shape for 1970. The public was ecstatic, and Graham became an even bigger celebrity during his time off the track. According to his daughter, he was the most out inpatient the hospital ever had. And you couldn't tie him down, despite the fact that Graham was left with minimal mobility after an extensive knee surgery. On March 1st, 1970, just five months after the crash that broke his legs, Graham was en route to South Africa for the first race of the season, the, where Elon Musk, uh, all his money comes from. <laughs> the general feedback from both the media and those around him was that this was uh, a little bit of a bad idea. But Graham being Graham didn't listen. Graham said he would be back, and here he was. Back, baby. The 1970 South African Grand Prix proved to be a tough race, with 13 drivers out of the 23 total dropping out. But Graham and his Lotus 49C ended in sixth place. Although it wasn't exactly the place he was used to finishing, many fans in the stands were crying in awe of one man's grit and determination. As for Graham, the driver, could barely get himself out of the car at the finish line, but he still had time to fix his hair. And what a hair it was. Big old long one coming right out of his cheek. Although Graham gave it his all for the rest of the season, as well as in 1971, he couldn't get back to his former glory. It was clear that his accident had taken a toll on him, and he was no longer the same driver that he once was. Or so everyone thought. Instead of retiring from racing after the 1971 season, Graham decided to enter one of the most grueling races he could, the 1972 24 Hours of Le Mans. It was a true physical and mental test for him, and this was a test he passed with flying colors. Alongside teammate Henri Pescarolo, In a Mantra Simca MS670, Graham Hill came back from a nearly career-ending injury to win Le Mans. Le Mans was the final jewel in his triple crown, as he became the only driver to win Le Mans, the Indy 500, and an F1 Drivers' Championship. But you know what he's never won? The PBW belt. That's right. The Pumphrey Backyard Wrestling belt. So I'd like to take this opportunity to call you out, Graham Hill, this Sunday at the PBW Stadium in my new backyard, nail ladder match. 25-foot ladder, 150,000 nails. Fluorescent light bulbs. Fluorescent (laughs) light bulbs. No rules, no ref. So if you really want to do a triple crown, maybe I'll do a triple crown of nails around that pretty little head of yours. You British bitch. In 1973, Graham set up his own Formula One team, Embassy Hill, but he failed to achieve the pace he was capable of. After failing to qualify for the 1975 Monaco Grand Prix, Graham decided to retire as a driver at age 46 and focus his energies on running the team 
led by his talented protege, Tony Breeze. Then, a few months later, tragedy struck. On the evening of November 29th, Graham and his Embassy Hill team were flying home from a test session at the Paul Ricard circuit in France. Graham was piloting the twin-engine Piper Aztec through less-than-ideal conditions. While attempting to land in dense fog, Graham crashed at the Elstree airfield near England. No one survived. After the crash, an investigation found that there were issues with the plane's licensing and the insurance was invalidated. Family members and the others on board brought legal action against the Hill estate, which left Graham's family nearly broke. This is where we pick up on the final part of our story and where Graham Hill's great legacy lives on with his son, Damon. Born September 17th, 1960, Damon Hill's formative years were a buzz with his father's career's success. Damon was only two years old when Graham won his first F1 World Championship and five when he won at Indy. In his autobiography, Damon Hill, Watching the Wheels, available on Amazon, Damon describes this time. Everything was coming up good for my parents after a long, hard road of sacrifices and risks, and I was right in the middle of it, soaking it up like a little spot. Sponge in a bucket of gravy. That's what it said. <laughs> so was it right there? The family lived in a gorgeous countryside estate that they coined Mill Hill. All right, if your house has a name, you're rich. That's, that's, you're rich. Yeah, you're pretty rich. Yeah, you're rich. Uh, what are you going to name your, your new house? My new house? Yeah. Uh, Pig Bucket. Pig Bucket. Yeah. <laughs> estate. Yeah, Pig Bucket Estate. <laughs> And some of Damon's earliest memories were of the lavishly wild parties his father would throw. One particularly fun anecdote was when the police came to shut down the party and Graham was able to persuade them to join instead. Hey, you bobbies, don't you take your little hats off and hand me your stick. Hey, look, everybody, I'm a bobby. Oh, knock, 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 knock. Who's there? Who is it? The Queen? I'm the Prime Minister. Prime Minister Graham Hill. And I'm a Bobby. And I'm going to beat this man to death. And none of you are going to say nothing about it. Damon writes that he watched one of them sheepishly return the next day to, to retrieve some of the missing pieces of his uniform. Um, hey... You know that gun I left there? <laughs> I'm going to get in a lot of trouble if you don't give it back to me. What gun? You know, the little gun looks like a police gun like a Bobby would carry. <laughs> a Bobby. I haven't seen no gun. Damon, you seen a gun? No, da. I haven't seen no gun. Well, maybe if you get down on your knees naked and you squeal like a little piggy, we might remember where this gun is. Ain't that right, Damon? Yeah, Dad. If this big old fat tub of lard gets naked and gets down and squeals like the little piggy that he is, it might jog my memory. Please, Graham, don't make me do that. I don't know, Damon. I think this man doesn't want his gun. Okay. Squeak, 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 squeak. That ain't sound like no pig I've ever heard, does it, Damon? No, da. That doesn't sound like a pig at all. Wee, 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 wee. Now cover yourself in mud. That's what happened. (laughs) Damon's early years were spent accompanying his famous father to the track for both practice and races. He was constantly asked if he was going to race, just like his dad. So the pressure of being Graham's son was noticeable from an early age. Much like his father, Damon did take an interest in mechanics, but found he was much more passionate about motorcycles than cars. Graham reveled in his son's interest and gave Damon his first motorbike a 50cc Honda Mini Trail when the boy was only 13 years old. Nice. Just two years later, an idyllic childhood came to a screeching halt. Damon was only 15 years old when Graham died. 
Damon reflected on the cruel irony of the accident's timing in his autobiography. Unconsciously, I had been rehearsing this moment for years, but since Dad had retired, I had let my guard down. I thought we had escaped. As mentioned earlier, after Graham's plane crash, the Hill family was deemed responsible for the deaths of all involved in the crash. Gone were the days of the massive countryside estate, private planes, and lavish parties. The grieving family had to significantly downsize, selling their prized possessions to make ends meet as they moved into a row house north of London. Damon escaped his pain through racing motorbikes and playing guitar in a punk band called The Hormones. Great band name. After graduating from high school, Damon began work as a motorcycle courier to help support both his racing and his family. In 1983, when Damon was around 23, he was feeling especially lost. He was reaching a plateau with motorbike racing. Back then, it was a much scrappier career than racing cars, with a way smaller payoff. Although he had won a 350cc Clubman's Championship at the Brands Hatch Circuit, he was still working as a building laborer to fund his passion. He's doing construction. The guy's gone from a mansion in some nice rolling hills, I assume, to a, a row hey, home. Didn't she used to be Graham Hill's kid? Yeah, now he's pounding nails in North London. It was Damon's mother, Betty, who suggested he should try racing cars. She was so supportive that she struck a deal with the owner of the Winfield Racing School in France to have Damon train for free. Pretty freaking good deal. Damon figured that he would give it a shot, and if he didn't like it, he could always quit and return to motorbikes. But Damon Hill was a chip off the old block and was quickly bitten by the racing bug. <laughs> Big thanks to ButcherBox for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Do you ever come across a deal that's so good that you're like, I gotta keep this a secret or else my friends are gonna blow up the spot. That's how I feel every time I get a ButcherBox in the mail. But it's too good to not share. ButcherBox has some of the highest quality meat and seafood you can find, and it's delivered directly to your door, plus free shipping in the continental US, plus no surprise fees. It's a great deal. It's super convenient, and the value is great. You've heard me talk at ends about ButcherBox, but I do love it. We got a ButcherBox. It had my favorite cut, prime rib. I'm a big prime rib steak guy. ButcherBox does prime rib really well. So that's why I'm so excited to bring you this deal they have coming up. This Black Friday, ButcherBox is offering our listeners one of their best steak deals. Get two 10-ounce ribeyes free in every box for a whole year when you join, plus an additional $10 off. Sign up today at butcherbox.com gas and use code gas. Free ribeyes for a year, plus $10 off at butcherbox.com gas with code gas. Thanks, ButcherBox. In 1985, Damon graduated through British Formula Ford and in his first full season won six races in a Van Diemen for Monadiant Racing. He even finished third and fifth in two UK national championships as well as third in the final Formula Ford Festival. In 1986, Damon planned to move up to the British F3 Championship with West Surrey Racing, but that was scrapped when his proposed teammate, Bertrand Fabby died in a testing accident. Thanks, Furby. Damon later said that when Bert was killed, I took the conscious decision that I wasn't going to stop doing that sort of thing. It's not just competing. It's doing something more exciting. I'm at my fullest skiing, racing, competitive eating, whatever. And I'm more frightened of letting it all slip and reaching 60 and finding I've done nothing. I mean, do I want to die not knowing how many pounds of a cheesecake I can eat? Damon then borrowed 100,000 pounds to self-finance a season for Murray Taylor Racing. Though he finished third in the 1988 championship, Damon had quite a bit of difficulty moving forward in his career. What, what would you guys competitive eat if you could? Anchovies. Anchovies. Uh -huh. I saw Joey Chestnut eat like 400 jalapeno peppers. Oh, my God. That's disgusting. That would destroy my intestines. What yeah. would I eat? Grapes, baby? Grapes. Competitive grapes eat would grapes. Grapes good. Yeah. Yeah. F yeah, some sort of fruit or vegetable. Yeah, fruit I'd be, be nice. afraid that I would choke on a grape. Mm. I'd say blueberries. It didn't help that the media scrutiny was intense. Damon wasn't just any rookie trying to get his footy. He was the legendary Graham Hill's son. 
A close friend of Damon's, George Harrison. Yes, that George Harrison from the Beatles said in a 1996 BBC documentary, yeah, I'd get back with the band at the drop of a hat. They both have my number. Hit me up. Oh, Damon? Oh, Damon had a terrible time. The pressure of trying to live up to Graham's reputation really got to him. Damon didn't have enough sponsorship money available to fund a draw. I mean, George Harrison could have given him some. You know, the Beatles were only a band for six years. Everyone listening at home. Yeah. Did you know that Donut has been around longer than the Beatles? Do you know you've worked here longer than the Beatles were a band? The Beatles were a band. I've worked at Donut longer than the Beatles have been a band, and I stand by my statement that the Beatles <laughs> so The Beatles are okay. They're fine. I don't like the tinny sound. They're fine. And also, I would say, like, Beatles, Led Zeppelin, like, ACDC. Like, these are all bands that people, at least my age, I'm 32. Mm -hmm. Like, in high school, when that was their whole identity, they're like, I love the Beatles. It's just because their parents liked it. Yeah. And they and, didn't know what else was And they're, cool. like, dorks. Yeah. Like, oh, you like the Beatles. Yeah, cool. like, I listen to, like, Far Side, you know? Yeah. I know the guy asked me for money at Gelson's the yeah. other day. Helter Skelter is a sick song. Yeah. Yeah. They have some bangers, but... Rocky Raccoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm a tree broken gold a heart. It's like half their half their songs are like jokes. Yeah. Half their songs. Isn't that kind of cool though? They're no. They're paid guap and it's they're making cool. joke songs. No, it's not cool. You make jokes. Huh? You, you make jokes. Wait, were half their songs actually jokes? I think so. The, I think they're just like, like we're getting Rocky paid Raccoon. To do this. He's a raccoon, and his wife's a raccoon, and the kids are raccoons, and they got regular jobs, <laughs> and they got a garden, and they walk around the streets like people. Oh, Rocky Raccoon, a oh, Rocky Raccoon, a oh, Rocky. There, I'm a Beatle. Yeah. Give me a billion Wait, dollars. did you just make that up? Yeah. Oh, I thought that was, I'm not kidding. I thought that was an actual yeah. Beatles song. Guys, this is also now a uh, Beatles Was Okay podcast. <laughs> oh, it started years ago. I get a lot of hate mail. All right, D Damon didn't have enough sponsorship money available to fund a drive for F3000, so, so he spent some time taking one-off rides until midway through the season when he landed a seat in the uncompetitive Mooncraft F3000 team. Although his best position was 15th, Damon's performance led to a seat in a Lola chassis for Middlebridge Racing in 1990. Though he took three pole positions and led five races, he never won a race during his Formula 3000 career. What do you guys want your kids to do when you grow when they grow up? Nothing. Really? Yeah. You want to know what I want my kids to do? What? Actually, Nolan, you go first. I don't even know. I'm not okay. I'm gonna, this ahead. is so easy, okay? Mm -hmm. My daughter, mm -hmm. Instagram influencer, yeah. and I mean, DJ. Yeah. My son, mm -hmm. I want him to be an F1 driver mm -hmm. and a DJ. Okay. Yeah, I want my kids to be extremely famous because I'm famous. Yeah. And then because of that, they get to invest in companies and make a bunch of money. Yeah. Well, I also think, like, if my kid could be an Also, F1 I driver, want them both to be DJs. Yeah. The the bottom line, they always have DJing to fall back on. Right. You know? Yeah. But I feel like if my kid we was an We need to F1 live driver, in the same neighborhood. Yeah. As soon as I move to Hidden Hills, you need to move to Hidden Hills. Yeah. And our kids have to go to the same school. Yeah, we can go to uh, Shibuya. Yeah. You we need to get a girlfriend, man, because I know. we our kids have to be at within a year or two. Yeah, they, I, and then also I want them to, you know, we'll summer in like New York, you know, up in the Hamptons. They go yeah. to Horace Mann half the year. Yeah. And then they're DJs. Yeah. And Instagram influencers as well. Yeah. I want my kids to be famous on Instagram, but then they like own June Shine or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It was this difficult time that Damon's hard work and determination impressed the Williams team enough to hire him as a test driver in 1992. This was a big break for the driver and a chance to prove himself by working his way up the ranks. While driving with Williams, Damon showed marked improvement, but he was itching for more racing experience. Midway through the 1992 season, Damon signed with the financially struggling Brabham team after driver Giovanna Amati's sponsorship had failed to provide. This proved to be a disaster. Damon only managed to qualify twice in eight races, but he continued his testing role with Williams and racked up over 18,000 testing miles 
with them in two years. As it turned out, all of those miles and hours of hard work really paid off. In 1992, driver Nigel Mansell, huh? Ever heard of him? We talked about him. He won the world championship for Williams in their FW14B with a Renault RS3C 3.5 liter V10 engine, a car that Damon helped test and develop. That following year when Mansell left Formula One to race Indy cars for some reason in America, Damon got promoted to a Williams driver. At the start of the 1993 season, his first as a competitive driver for Williams, Damon Hill had a lot to prove. Outside of the whole being Graham Hill's son thing, he had only had two Grand Prix starts under his belt. But Damon made the most of this new opportunity and won three races in total that season. Three wins! His first win was at the Hungarian Grand Prix, which he dedicated to the Hill family past, present, and future. Damon finished the season in third overall behind his title-winning teammate, Alain Prost. Dude, that's sick, man. Prost's retirement at the end of the season ushered in a game-changing lineup for Williams. Ayrton Senna, a three-time world champion at only 33 years old, joined the team for the 1994 season. We say that at only 33 years old now, but like now Max Verstappen is two-time at like 25 or whatever. Way retired. Yeah. How, long, how old is uh, Fernando is Alonso? Uh, He's like 60. Fernando's what, 41? 41. He's ancient. It's pretty old. As we know and covered in our past gas episode about the 1994 F1 season, tragedy was just around the corner. Senna was killed in a devastating crash at the San Marino Grand Prix. In that instant, everything changed for Damon. Responsibility of leading the Williams team fell on him. In an eerie mirroring of his father's leadership after the death of Jim Clark a few decades before, Damon too met that challenge head on. But this challenge wouldn't come without a fight. Enter the driver to beat, Michael Schumacher, the German driving for Benetton. The Damon Hill-Michael Schumacher rivalry is one for the record books. Their beef started at the British Grand Prix after Schumacher was disqualified for not adhering to a five-second penalty after he had passed pole sitter Damon on the formation laps. Damon won the British Grand Prix and Schumacher got a two-race ban, which really pissed Schumacher off. But he would be back and dead set on beating Damon. The two spent the season in contention for the title, and it wasn't until the Australian Grand Prix that the 1994 season came to its controversial conclusion. Like the rest of the season, Damon and Schumacher were neck and neck for a majority of the season's final race. On lap 35 of the 81-lap contest, Schumacher went wide at the East Terrace corner and brushed the wall. Damon was suddenly right behind him and saw his chance to pass, taking the inside line into the next corner. As Damon's Williams passed alongside the Benetton, Schumacher appeared to turn in aggressively. There was contact between the two rivals, but at first, it was unclear if this was intentional or not. Either way, both cars were forced to retire and resulted in Schumacher taking home the title. He had beaten Damon by a single championship point. Uh, if you watch this crash back, there's still a lot of history, a lot of narrative, and a lot of people commenting on this very event. And, you know, it can look like a calculated move that Schumacher did intentionally do it. I do think that he sort of intentionally did it, but it's also a move that... He is known to make moves like that intentionally. Yes. yes. So, But it's also like something, a mistake or, or a, a rushed decision that you would make if you had crashed into the wall in the previous corner. So I kind of see both sides of it. I think it's better to, instead of still debating about it, in 1995, Damon came back to the grid, singularly obsessed with beating Michael Schumacher. However, that hyper-focus worked against him. He put so much pressure on himself that he became sloppy. Damon turned it around by the end, but was forced to take a good look at himself before the 1996 season. Through meditation and working out, Damon became more focused than ever. In 1996, Damon came out of the gate swinging in his Williams FW18 and won the first three races of the season. He had finally proven that he was a great driver in his own right, not just the son of one. Yet, he was about to face his toughest race, the Monaco Grand Prix. Due to his dad's reputation as Mr. Monaco, Damon always felt eclipsed by his father's legacy of the 
Damon always felt eclipsed by his father's legacy at the infamous track. But this year, Damon felt he could finally achieve what his father had so many times. Until he didn't. Though he won two races after Monaco, it was announced that Williams was dropping him at the end of the season. With his teammate Jacques Villeneuve replacing him as Williams' star driver. But Damon Hill wasn't going down without a fight. One night, he waited outside of a bar just as Jacques entered the alley. He hit him with a pipe. That's not how it happened. Despite Williams favoring his teammate, Damon was still in contention in the championship fight. It would all come down to the season's finale at the Japanese Grand Prix, as it often does, even though it always rains. (laughs) Now, even though Villeneuve took pole position, he had a poor start to the race and was later forced to retire when a wheel fell off of his car. That's scary. Ask me how I know. Always torque down your wheel studs. Mm -hmm. Then, after 52 laps, Damon Hill crossed the finish line and won his first driver's championship at the ripe old age of 36. Like his father before him, Damon was able to shine in times of adversity and make an epic comeback when no one expected him to, when no one believed that he could. After his new championship title, Damon went on a victory lap press tour around the globe and even stopped by New York for an appearance on The Late Show with David Letterman. During the interview, Dave popped a picture of the great Graham Hill onto his desk and asked Damon about his father's achievements. Damon reflects on this moment in his autobiography. It was then that I realized that this would always be the case. Graham Hill was a massive star, and I was just doing what he had done. But he had done it bigger, better, before me. And there was no getting around that, even for a newly crowned world champion. But better to be a chip off the old block of Graham Hill than quite a few lesser alternatives. Damon stayed in Formula One for another three seasons until he retired in 1999 to open for Limp Biscuit <laughs> at Woodstock. <laughs> what, do you th- what do you think of that, Andy? What do you think of that quote at the end there? Um, I thought it was really cerebral. I thought it was really one of a kind and unafraid to reference. <laughs> and it made me honestly like pumped up. It's kind of like a locker room speech, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's like there's one or two ways you can go with that. You know, like there's a lot of people who are pretty good at stuff, but then like one of their parents is the greatest ever. Yeah. You know, so like you could either be a guy who is like, I'm as good as my dad. I can be as good. I don't want to hear about my dad. This is an interview about me. Last time I checked, I was the one getting the questions asked. Or you could be like, yeah, my dad was awesome. Yeah. The best ever, potentially. And I'm just grateful that I got some of that. Yeah. You know, and I think he handled that at least, you know, towards the end of his career. I think he, I mean, I'm sure he wrestled with it at times, Mm -hmm. but at least at the end of his career, it did. To me, it seems like he really found, you know, a perfect balance and, and like a real peace and, and a, a, a great deal of pride being the offspring and getting some of that amazing talent mm-hmm. from someone who everyone agrees is one of the greatest athletes in the history of sport, mm-hmm. you know? So I think very British answer. Uh, and and very very very, very graceful, well put. yeah, very, very graceful. graceful, very yes. graceful, very graceful. Graham Hill is often considered one of the most complete drivers in the history of motorsport, and his son Damon is only one of two sons, alongside Nico Rosberg, of a Formula One champion to also win a title. Though there is a modern obsession with nepotism in motorsport, the Hill family proves that while talent and ability are important, morals and strength of character matter more. I mean, the guy did lose everything. Became a construction worker and then yeah, got that back is into insane racing. Insane and that's the thing, yeah. He did this like his dad was Graham Hill, and I'm sure you can't avoid some level of nepotism if your dad is Graham Hill. Mm-hmm. But you can't avoid that. It's not like he was racing 
uh, around the grounds of their estate on his own private cart track. Mm-hmm. You know, they had everything, lost it all, and then got it all back. And I think, like, having everything and losing it all and getting it back sometimes is harder. Yeah. You know, look at the Adams family. Uh-huh. <laughs> they had everything. They lost it all. They got it back. And uh, that happened to my family. We We had a lot. We lost it all, and I'm working very hard to to uh, mm-hmm. give uh, my next of kin uh, something to be proud of. So, it is pretty crazy that someone that didn't grow up like carding could then go on to do this, which makes me wonder. I'm 32. Do we still have time? <laughs> do you think it's too late? Jim Carrey didn't become an actor. I will fund your racing team. I will fund your racing team. Okay. Okay. Carding. We're starting carding. Carding. Yes. Okay. So just because we're starting carding, what do we say? Fifty million dollars <laughs> yeah. budget a year. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. much right. does a carding career start to cost? It'd be like easily like fifty grand a year to do that. Oh. Oh. Okay. All right. Let's do and it. If we have fifty mil. There's a lot of spending money. Yeah. We can fifty make mil. That. We're flying private. Yeah. We're baby. flying private to all the to the cardings. Yeah. I remember there's a kid. Um, in my high school, or no, in elementary school, there was a professional go kart racer. Mm-hmm. Never heard of him again. I don't know where he is, Billy. Oh, he did. Where the hell are you, where Billy? You yeah, Billy. You mean uh, what was what was his last name? Do you know? I don't remember. Oh. It's also it, uh, whenever we talk about like these old F one guys, the intro always includes like two time drivers champion and now like there's multiple people who are like yeah yeah there's multiple people on the grid right now that are two time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. two time th- like max fernando, is three fernando lewis uh uh max max sebastian marcona i think that's it so yeah four drivers on, two, right now yeah right now yeah yeah and it Lewis is, has like seven. Yeah, Lewis has got seven. Yeah. F one definitely seems a lot more sterile now to me than it was back then. Everything's well, a lot more. I mean, st- yeah, it's more sterile. Everything's a lot more sterile. Like they used to smoke cigarettes on the on the side while of And a guy games. like died every other week. Yeah, because like the car flipped in half and his entrails were like spilled across the track. Yeah, like so, I want that back. Like how like, do we bring this? back? The NBA they used to like go sit on the bench and light up a cigarette. Yeah, and like eat a cheeseburger. Well, because it was yeah. good. For, cigs were good for you back then. Remember? Yeah. Until they started putting all this crap yeah. in Yeah, until they put in, started putting chemtrails in it. <laughs> but that <laughs> is a subject for another podcast. Guys, thank you so much for listening to this. This is so much fun. I say it every time we do this. This is, I'm not joking, my favorite thing to do at Donut, and they make me do a ton of stuff here. Uh, Andy, thank you so much for being uh, a guest on the last two ones. We can't wait to have you back. Nolan, you killed it. I'm back. Thank As you. always. Thank you, James. Uh, I'd like to give myself a big old pat on the back. I had some really good riffs in there. Uh, thanks to our producers, Christina Felsky and uh, Nick Giamoso. Gavin, you can go ahead and keep burning in hell. I don't even know where the f- you are thanks to our sponsors support the sponsors that support us that's why we get to make this stuff follow the boys at nolan j sykes follow andy at andy brand yep. on instagram also at spec doc work on instagram and just spec work on twitch and spec work on twitch he has a really really great twitch we uh, all all the uh, donut hosts drop in from time to time and uh, tell your friends about this podcast if you like it. Word of mouth is still the best way to spread the word. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? All right. Bye, guys. Bye.